Thank you very much, Rabbi Robertson, for opening up your synagogue for this uh, very magnificent and uh, appropriate and auspicious event. I'd like to give a special welcome to our two local city council people, Mark Levine and Helen Rosenthal. Mm -hmm. Mark. Mm -hmm. And uh, even though kind of they are new, kind of they feel to those of us who are involved that they are old timers and really understand the issues that we have in the community and we know that they are fighting for the needs of our community. Um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome our oldest friend over here that we all know and love who could, would never think of sharing an experience without being with us, our Borough President, Gail Brewer. It's, it's a great honor and privilege for me to introduce our new Mayor of New York, Bill de Blasio. And a man whose passion and commitment to human dignity, democracy and justice knows no bounds and we wish you tremendous success as mayor of our great city. We are proud and honored that you have chosen to be with the West Side Kojo here at the Lincoln Square Synagogue to share your reflections on Yom HaShoah. Without further ado, Mayor de Blasio. Thank you, everyone. It's a real honor. Actually, for height reasons, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. It's a real honor to be with you tonight. And I want to thank everyone who's a part of the Lincoln Square Synagogue. A particular thanks to Rabbi Shaul Robinson for his leadership. And Michael Landau has been a friend for a long time, and he does so much for the community of the West Side and beyond. Thank you to him. You've heard the great elected officials who are here, all of whom I think serve with real distinction. To be invited tonight is something special and important to me to commemorate Yom HaShoah. It is important because it's something we have to constantly work to understand. It has to be present and immediate in our thinking. I, like so many people in this room, have had the opportunity over time to get some sense, some small sense, of the meaning of what happened. I've been to Israel three times, I've been to Yad Vashem three times. Every time it's impossible not to not only be moved and be forced into uh, very real thoughts and a pensive state, but every time I learn more, I see something that makes me think more deeply. I went last time with my wife, Shirlane, and my son, Dante, and I think for me, seeing people Go to Yad Vashem for the first time, you see the, the shock, the revelation that comes over anyone who looks this whole history squarely in the eye. And I have also, over the years, known many survivors. I've heard them tell their stories, the stories of their parents. Um, for me, it, it became more and more real, it became more and more clear that we're talking about an experience that happened in the lifetimes of so many people still here, including people in this room, it reminds you we can't think of it as ancient history. We can't think of it as something that could never be again. That in fact, the reason we commemorate is not only to give honor to all who were lost, but to feel the urgency that we wish people had felt who might have stepped forward to save those in danger back in that time. I, in the city council, represented the Borough Park in Kensington, among other neighborhoods in Brooklyn. And um, I went to a Shabbos dinner one night with a family, and the matriarch of the family was a Holocaust survivor. And somehow, despite all she had been with through, she had a life-affirming aspect to her. She had an embrace an appreciation for the fact that she had survived and built a large and thriving family. And in the middle of the dinner, at one point my children were there, and I think she wanted to help them feel that this is something the next generation had to understand and carry on, and she rolled up her sleeve. 
and she was a survivor of Auschwitz, and the numbers were just as clear today as then. And it was a stark reminder that we are obligated to teach the next generation. It's something we do to defend the Jewish community. It's something we do to defend humanity. Because I think what happened was clearly an affront to all humanity and an indicator of something that lurks in the human experience that can never be ignored. So I think it's important we commemorate, I think it's important that we have museums, it's important we have programs to try to make this real, to try and show our generation and the next that we have to be vigilant. The, as was mentioned, the events of the day remind us this is not an idle exercise. What happened in Kansas was sadly very, very pertinent to this discussion, and we know that Anti-Semitism is alive and well all over the world, and that is a tragic fact. But the only way we confront it is by seeing it as the fact that it is. We know it's alive in this city. A few weeks ago, the Anti-Defamation League came out with a report indicating an increase over the last year in anti-Semitic bias incidents. And that, when I saw it, focused me further on the fact that we we have to address each and every one of these moments head on. We have to with all the tools we have, and yes, thank God, in this society, that includes a police force that will stand up for the community, that will treat a biased crime as exactly what it is, and find the perpetrators, and we will prosecute them to the full extent of the law, and that is, in fact, what has to happen in a civilized society. But I will end with just a quick point or two. I will end with the fact that so many people in this room already know, but it bears repeating. As the world watched, not only in the early 1940s or the late 1930s when things had gotten so evidently out of hand and when the pathway to the Holocaust was becoming more and more clear, but you could see the seeds of it in the 1920s and the 1930s. You could see the tragic momentum starting to build and it is so important to understand that that has to be confronted. I reference again Yad Vashem, and Yad Vashem, a very touching part of the museum, is the tribute to those who stood in solidarity with the Jewish people. And it's touching, and it's appreciated, and it's called the Path of the Righteous Gentiles. And yet, when I went there the first time many years ago, it struck me that the path wasn't that long in the scheme of things that a lot of people looked away, a lot of people in this country, a lot of people in other countries that were supposed to be civilized and democratic looked away. And the ultimate expression of this tragedy occurred in a country, in the case of Germany, that was at the time assumed to be amongst the quote-unquote most civilized on the earth. So none of us should become too comfortable with the notion of what can't happen in our time or what can't happen in our kind of country. I think the very lesson is that we protect all peoples, we protect democracy, we protect life by having the maturity and the sobriety to know that it can happen in our time, it can happen in our place, and that's how we truly honor those who were lost, is to make sure that we, we will stand up in the way we wish the onlookers of a previous generation had when they had their time, when they had their moment. I'll finish by saying, after all that's happened, after all we commemorate, we remember the core principles of Judaism that are so uplifting, that are so positive. We remember the principle of tikkun olam, healing the world. And after all the Jewish people have been through over the many, many centuries, that is still the animating feeling running through the faith and the people that we're here to heal. And the fact that that has never been extinguished is something to truly not only remember, but to celebrate. And we'll bring that spirit forward with us as well in this city and in this world. Thank you and God bless you.